Welcome to the pastors and members of the world whose hope is in heaven and eternal life. I am Lee Jun, a center instructor who was taught by the leader of the Simon tribe among the 12 tribes of Shincheonji. Our tribe leader was taught by the chairman of Shincheonji, Lee Man Hee. Thank you so much for attending Shincheonji's testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings seminar. The topic of today's lecture will be on the meanings of the figurative fire, incense sensor, and pot. Elementary Lesson 7 Through the word today, I hope you will have a precious and blessed time to perceive the parables of the kingdom of heaven and its reality. I believe the pastors already know this word. However, I would truly appreciate it if you could kindly hear out the explanations of the word I will be covering today. Let's first begin with finding out about the meanings of the figurative fire, incense sensor, and pot. First, the meaning of the figurative fire is the word. The figurative incense sensor is referring to a person, and incense refers to the prayers of the saints. The incense smoke figuratively refers to the sound of prayers being lifted up, and the figurative pot refers to the church. Let us find out one by one through the Bible why these answers are the way they are. First, let's look at the spiritual meaning of the figure of fire. There are two types of fire in the Bible, physical fire and spiritual fire that share similar characteristics as that of physical fire. In Genesis 19 from the Old Testament of the Bible, God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, who are full of sin, with actual, literal fire. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it is said that the elements will be melted with the heat of fire. Revelation 20 also says that after a thousand years, fire will come down from heaven and devour the enemies. This kind of fire is actual, literal fire, and it is an event of literal fire judgment. Today, in this lesson, we will take a look at the spiritual fire borrowing the characteristics of physical fire. So, how did you understand the meaning of spiritual fire? Among the testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings, let's read verse Luke chapter 12, verse 49 to understand the true meaning of fire today. I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Yes, well read. It is written that at the first coming about 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to throw fire on the earth. And when Jesus said how he wished this fire would be kindled, we can see that Jesus actually wanted this fire to be ignited on earth. If that's the case, what kind of fire is this fire seen in this parable verse in Luke chapter 12, verse 49? If in the event this was literal fire, that means Jesus set fire to every town on earth. However, do you really think that was the case? If we understand the meaning of the parable of fire today, we will be able to understand what it meant Jesus came to bring fire on the earth. Furthermore, we'll be able to understand the meaning of fire judgment at the end times, and we'll be able to clearly understand what it meant for Jesus to baptize with fire. Many people have various interpretations of fire judgment in the last days, saying it is a nuclear war or it is World War III. Let's check through the Bible whether fire judgment is a physical judgment of fire or a spiritual judgment of fire. First of all, to explain the meaning of the figure of fire, first, the figure of fire is referring to the Word. The reason why it is possible to give an accurate answer is because about 2,000 years ago, 
Jesus promised in John chapter 16, verse 25, that although he was speaking figuratively at that time, when the proper time comes, he said he would no longer speak in that way, but speak plainly about the Father. And because the promised time has come today, we have been able to understand the reality of all the parables accurately. We must perceive the meanings of parables. We'll be able to understand the Bible and the kingdom of heaven. I sincerely hope that everyone will be able to go to heaven through the revealed word that was opened from heaven. Now, let us take a biblical look at the parable of fire. As you already know, God spoke all the mysteries of the parables spiritually by taking the physical characteristics of His creation. If we understand physical characteristics of His creation, we will be able to easily understand the true meanings of spiritual parables. Therefore, let's first take a look at the physical characteristics of fire. Fire, as you know, is very hot. Everything can be burned with fire, and everything that can be burned can get destroyed. In this way, although fire can be very beneficial to people, if it is used incorrectly, it can also be a disaster that burns everything down. Let's check the spiritual meaning of fire one by one through the Bible. First, let's read Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Well read. As we saw in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29, it is written, the word of God is like fire. The word of God is compared to fire because just as fire has characteristics of being hot that can burn and consume, in the same way, the word of God also burns and consumes our sins and, furthermore, judges the wicked who have sinned. Also, in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14, the word of God that was in the mouth of prophet Jeremiah was made like fire, and the fire of the word would consume the people who were like wood. This means that the word of God, which is fire of God, becomes the law and judges the people who have sinned, just as little trees are destroyed by burning it with literal fire. The meaning of the figure of fire compared to what we have confirmed through the Bible is the Word of God. I believe you perceived that God's Word can burn away our sin. It can also judge sinful people. Next, let's take a look at the judgment by fire at the end times that many Christians today and even everyone in the world wonder about. Many people think of judgment by fire in the last days as a huge disaster that will happen literally, saying it will be a nuclear war, or World War III, or the end of planet Earth. As a result, many people fear judgment by fire, and they hope that the end times will never come. What do all of you think about this? Why would one get judged in the first place? Yes, a person receives judgment when they have sinned. It's one thing for someone who sinned to receive judgment, but why does all of planet Earth and all of creation get judged when they are not the ones that sinned? Isn't everything God's creation? Thus, we must understand that judgment of fire is not physical judgment by fire, but judgment by spiritual fire. What then is spiritual fire judgment? Since the meaning of the parable of fire is referring to the Word of God, spiritual fire judgment means judgment by the Word. Let's check through the Bible. First, let's read the Old Testament prophecy of Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire. 
says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you, who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Well read. Looking at the words of Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, God prophesied, There will come a day when it will burn like a fiery furnace of fire. On that day, it is written that the arrogant and evildoer will become like stubble set on fire. Stubble is like dried up grass. Then when the prophecies of Malachi come true, it is promising that there will be a fire judgment in which all the wicked will be burned with fire. If this fire judgment is a literal one, it would be a huge catastrophe and disaster, wouldn't it? On the other hand, for those who fear God, it says that the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. In other words, they will not be judged by fire, but will be restored and saved. It is an event in which judgment and salvation occur at the same time. Let's see how this prophecy of Malachi was fulfilled about 400 years later through Jesus at the time of His first coming. As seen in Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, Jesus who came to this earth about 2,000 years ago gathered believers who were like wheat born again from God's seed, spiritually harvested them to the barn and saved them. However, the chaff, that is those who appear to be believers on the outside but are empty on the inside, were judged by the unquenchable fire that is the Word of God. According to Matthew 23, verse 33, Jesus judged the scribes and Pharisees who were the pastors at that time with words like fire saying, You brood of vipers! You snakes! How will you escape being condemned to hell? And He judged them with words that were like fire. The dictionary meaning of judgment is to make decisions based on the law. At the first coming, Jesus testified that the scribes and Pharisees were false pastors of Satan who preached lies through the law of God's word, that is like fire. This was a judgment by fire at the first coming. This is the way in which the prophecy of Malachi chapter 4 was fulfilled. However, the prophecy of judgment by fire is not only found in the Old Testament, but is also prophesied in the New Testament. Let's confirm this through the Bible. Now, let's read Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. The first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down upon the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Well read. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 7, it is recorded that at the second coming of the Lord, hail and fire, mixed with blood, comes down from heaven upon the earth, and a third of the earth, trees and grass are burned with fire. It would be terrifying if something literally like this happened, right? Based on the words of this prophecy, some claim that the earth will end when the Lord returns. Some have interpreted fire as a nuclear bomb, some has volcanic eruptions, and others as World War III. But everyone, we must first know what is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4. It says, Generation comes and generations go, but the earth remains forever. So a generation can go, and another generation can come, and this cycle can repeat constantly. However, didn't God say the earth will remain forever? That means judgment by fire that takes place is not a fire judgment that annihilates the earth. You may also know that the book of Revelation is a prophetic book that is written in parables. Judgment is not a judgment of fire that literally burns the earth and consumes it. And we already learned what the parable of fire, trees, and grass represent. Fire is the word of God. And the parable of the earth, trees, and grass spiritually refers to people. In other words, 
just as recorded in John chapter 12, verse 48. Judgment in the last days will be judgment by the words of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, it is recorded that at the time of the end, we will be judged according to our deeds before God, according to the words of the Bible. Therefore, the judgment by fire at the second coming of the Lord is not judgment of physical fire that ends the earth, but a spiritual judgment with the Word. Therefore, believers who believe in God and Jesus and whose hope is in heaven and salvation should not be afraid of the ends of the earth, but should instead examine how much they know, keep God's Word, and put it into practice. Next, let's look at the baptism by fire that burns our sins. First, baptism means washing and making it clean. However, what does fire baptism mean? Yes, that's right. It means a baptism by the word. Let's read the words of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 6 to 7 to understand this better. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Well read. In Isaiah chapter 6, we see that an angel came to Isaiah with coals from the altar and touched the mouth of the prophet Isaiah. What would happen to Isaiah's mouth if the charcoal the angel brought with him were literal coals? Wouldn't it burn him? Wow, just thinking about it, you can only imagine how terrible that would be. But strangely, it is written that when Isaiah received this live coal, his guilt was taken away and his sins atoned for. Then, Prophet Isaiah became a man of God who preached the Word of God. Judging from this, the live coal with fire brought by the angel is not literal fire, but the Word of God that is like fire. And, it's by the fire of God, the guilt and sins of Prophet Isaiah were consumed and made clean. This is what we call fire baptism. Likewise, about 2,000 years ago at the first coming, Jesus also came to baptize with fire. The baptism that John the Baptist gave was a baptism of immersing a person in water and bringing them out. What would happen if the baptism by fire Jesus gave was also baptism with physical fire? A person's head could burn, or ouch, it's hot! Someone could get extremely hurt. Then what person would possibly want to receive fire baptism? We must understand that this fire is not a literal fire, but a spiritual one that is a baptism of the Word of God. At the first coming of Jesus, He said we were cleansed through His words. In John chapter 15, verse 3, Jesus said that His disciples were already cleansed by the words He had spoken. Surely, it's not the actual bodies of the disciples that were cleansed, correct? Thus, it was the words of Christ that became like fire and consumed the sins and evil within the disciples. This was baptism by fire given by Jesus at the first coming. To summarize, we should remember that fire baptism is a baptism of the Word. Also, as you know, there are two spiritual entities in the Bible being God and Satan, which is why there are also two types of spiritual things. Even with the parable of fire, if there is a fire of God, then there's also the fire of Satan, right? This time, we will go over Satan's fire. What then is a true spiritual meaning of Satan's fire? Yes, Satan's fire refers to Satan's words, that is, his lies. Let's check in scriptures to gain a better understanding. 
Let's read Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 2. Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to His command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Well read. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 2, we see that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron the high priest, offered up to God unauthorized fire in an incense censer contrary to God's command. And thus, fire came out before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Of course, the incident at this time is a literal event, but if we look at its spiritual meaning, the unauthorized fire that Nadab and Abihu put in the censer would be like Satan's fire that is his lies. Even at the second coming of Jesus, it is prophesied that people will be killed with Satan's fire. In Revelation chapter 9, verses 17 to 18, it is written that at the second coming of Jesus, there are riders and horses of Satan where fire, smoke, and sulfur come out of their mouths, killing a third of mankind. This passage was recorded in parables. In Isaiah chapter 31, verse 3, it is written that the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses are flesh. Therefore, the parable of horse refers to a person that is a flesh. The horses shown in Revelation chapter 9 are events prophesying about false pastors of Satan and the fire, smoke, and sulfur coming out of their mouths are Satan's lies that kill people's souls. As such, we can see that there are two kinds of spiritual fire, the fire of God and the fire of Satan. The fire of God is a word of truth that washes away one's sins and uncleanliness within the inner person. Satan's fire refers to his lies that kills the soul within the inner person. That is why, amongst these two types of spiritual fires, we must receive the fire of God and not the fire of Satan. Let us summarize the parable verses content recorded in scriptures. The fact that Jesus came to throw fire on the earth means that he came to preach the word of God, which is compared to fire, to the hearts of people who are being compared to the earth. Those who believe in God's words that is like fire, will be baptized with fire, which will forgive the sins in their hearts. In turn, however, those who do not believe will be judged by the word that is like fire. Unfortunately, at the first coming, most of the Jews did not ignite the fire of the word in their hearts, but instead persecuted and killed Jesus. However, I truly believe and hope that those who attended today's seminar will be ignited with the fire of the Word in one's hearts so that we will all become believers who reach the kingdom of heaven by having our sins and uncleanliness washed away. I will now organize the meaning of the figure of fire. I believe we all have now perceived that the parable of fire means the Word of God, judgment by fire means judgment by the Word, and baptism by fire means baptism by the Word. Now, at this time, we'll go over the second topic, the figurative incense censer. First, let's read the parable verse in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Well read. The parable we just read shows that there is an angel that filled the censer with fire and hurled it on the earth and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. If fire is poured out, then a fire should ignite. But why is that not the case? And instead, peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and earthquakes took place instead. Also, since angels are spirits, how can it light a censer with fire? This is written in parables. And thus, we need to understand the parables through the Bible to understand its meaning clearly. First, 
The true meaning of the incense censer is that it is a vessel or bowl that holds fire. The figure of fire refers to the word, just as we have learned today. What then do you think is the meaning of a censer or bowl? Yes, as you have learned in the last seminar, it, it refers to people. Now, let's take a look at the parable of incense censer and break it down biblically one by one. First, let's take a look at the origin and characteristics of incense censer. Censers were tools used to offer sacrifices to God in the tabernacle of Moses during the time of the Old Testament. The tabernacle of Moses, which existed about 3,500 years ago, contains the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. It is written in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9, that the tabernacle was an illustration for the present time. This means there were secrets of heaven hidden as parables within the tabernacle of Moses. Among them, today, we'll take a look at the incense censer placed within the tabernacle. A physical incense censer is a vessel or bowl that contains fire. And if you put fire in the censer and burn incense in it with fire, then the smoke of the incense rises to heaven. Let's summarize the meaning of incense censer, fire, incense, and incense smoke one by one. The true meaning of the incense censer is referring to a person similar in meaning to the figurative bowl. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, Jesus said that Apostle Paul was a chosen vessel or instrument. In Romans chapter 9, verses 21 to 24, it says that vessels or instruments are us, the believers called by the word. What then is a fire inside the incense censer? We can understand from what we just learned prior that it is the word. What do you think is a parable of incense? In Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, it says that incense is a prayer of the saints. Also, Psalm chapter 141, verse 2 says, May my prayer be set before you like incense. So we can see that incense is referring to the prayers of the saints. Then what is the incense smoke? In Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 to 4, it is recorded that the incense goes up before God from the hand of an angel along with the prayers of the saints. Judging from this, wouldn't the prayers of the saints rise up to the Lord through the hands of the angels like incense smoke rising to heaven? Thus, incense smoke refers to the prayers of the saints rising up to God. We can see that the incense censer, incense, and incense smoke are all pertaining to the prayers of believers being offered up to God. If we pray earnestly with the words of fire in our hearts, like incense burning within a censer, then our prayers will reach up to God like the rising smoke of the incense. Now, let's take a look at the prayers that God receives. Let's read John chapter 15, verse 7. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. Well read. In John chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus said, If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. What we can understand from these words is that just as incense burns and the smoke rises to heaven only when the incense burns with fire, in the same way, it is when we know God's word, contain his words in our heart, and pray according to his word, will God receive our prayers and answer them. Prayers that are offered up without knowing God's word or his will are not appropriate prayers for God. Therefore, I hope that we can be those who first understand the Word of God and pray according to the Word so that our prayers can be lifted up to the Lord and become those who pray in this way. Next, let's take a look at the reality of incense censors that appeared in each era. First, 
Let's read John chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and His worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. Well read. About 2,000 years ago, the reality of the incense censor was Jesus, who put the word of truth in His heart and offered up worship and prayer to God. Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Even at the first coming, many believers offered up sacrifices, offerings, and prayers to God through their pastors, such as the scribes and Pharisees. But their sacrifices and prayers were not received by God. And it was only Jesus who received the word of God, whose worship and sacrifices offered in spirit and truth were received by God. Therefore, the reality of the incense censor at the first coming containing fire was Jesus. Let's see if there is a shepherd even at the time of second coming who is like an incense censor who receives a word like fire and offers up worship and prayer. In Revelation 8, verse 5, which is recorded in parables, show there is an angel, a spirit, who takes a censer, who fills it with fire from the altar of God and poured it upon the earth. What we can see from this verse is there is a shepherd who is like an incense censer at the time of second coming who receives the fire of God's word. However, who is a shepherd? In Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus promised to give the hidden manna to an overcomer. As we have already learned, the hidden manna is a revealed word that is spiritual food that could be eaten at the second coming of the Lord. The reality of the incense censor containing the word at the time of the Lord's second coming is a promised shepherd that is the hymn overcomes who received the revealed word of God, the hidden manna of Jesus, as it was promised in the book of Revelation. God, He accepts worship and prayer of those who have His word. How could God receive worship and prayers offered to Him from those who do not know the Bible or His will? Just as God received worship and prayers 2,000 years ago from the side of Jesus, today, at the time of the Lord's second coming, shouldn't we offer up worship and prayer from the side of the overcomer, that is, from where the shepherd who received the word is present, for God to receive them? I hope we can all become believers who can provide worship and prayer that God desires by examining and discerning through the Bible. Let us summarize the content of the parable. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, the fire that the angel puts in the incense censer is the word of God, and the censer is a promised shepherd, the him who overcomes, and the earth are referring to the saints. This is the content of the promised shepherd, the him who overcomes, who received the word, witnessing to the word of God, which is like fire to the saints. Then I will summarize the parable of the incense censer, incense, and incense smoke once again. Just as incense burns with fire and the incense burns, the smoke rises up to heaven, a person's heart that is like a censer must contain the word that is like fire in their hearts and then pray fervently as if the smoke of the incense is rising. That is a way in which our prayers can reach up to God and we can get our prayers answered. Furthermore, the reality of the censer containing fire at the first coming was Jesus, and the reality of the censer containing fire at the second coming is the one who overcomes. Now, let's take a look at the figure of pot. Let's read the parable recorded in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 13. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a boiling pot tilting away from the Lord, I answered. Well read. After reading the parable, we can see there is a boiling pot and it is tilting from the north. Well, if that's the case, 
wouldn't all the boiling water from the pot be completely poured out? Also, boiling water in a pot or a pan is a common sight within our homes. However, that's not what God is speaking of here, correct? The book of Jeremiah is a prophetic book that records what will happen in the future, and it was written in parables. Therefore, the parable of the boiling pot seen in scriptures is referring to a spiritual pot. First, let's talk about the true spiritual meaning of the figurative pot. The parable pot of pot refers to an organization that is the church, where the people of God are gathered. Let's start with the physical characteristics of a pot. A pot or a pan is a tool for boiling or cooking food, such as meat. And in terms of it being a vessel, we can say it's a very large one. Let's check through the Bible why the meaning of the parable of pot is likened to the church. First, let's read Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 3. They say, will it not soon be time to build houses? The city is a cooking pot, and we are the meat. Well read. Reading Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 3. It is comparing the city to a cooking pot, and we, referring to people as the meat. During the Old Testament times, God's chosen people gathered in the city. However, where do God's people gather today? Yes, they gather at a church. Just as meat starts cooking within a boiling pot, people start changing within an organization such as a city. If a person is contained within an organization such as an army, then they will become a soldier. And if a person is contained within an organization like a school, they learn a lot of knowledge and grow. If we are then a part of an organization like the church, won't we be transformed into believers who can go to heaven? So, in the Bible, the church is being compared to a pot, and the believers in that church are compared to the meat in a pot. Then, let's look at the different types of pots. The parable of a spiritual pot is a church. However, remember how there are two types of spiritual things? Even with spiritual pots as well, there are two types, God's pot and Satan's pot. First, let's take a look at Satan's pot. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 24, verses 3 to 6. Tell this rebellious house a parable and say to them, and this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Put on the cooking pot, put it on, and pour water into it. Put into it the pieces of meat, all the choice pieces, the leg and the shoulder. Fill it with the best of these bones. Take the pick of the flock, pile wood beneath it and for the bones. Bring it to a boil and cook the bones in it. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, Woe to the city of bloodshed, to the pot now encrusted, whose deposit will not go away. Empty it piece by piece without casting lots for them. Well read. Ezekiel chapter 24 verses 3 to 6 is expressed in parables regarding pastors gathering the congregation of their church into a pot to be cooked and boiling them in words, just like meat being placed into a cooking pot and boiled until the bones become soft. Just as a person who is being persuaded might ask, how did you cook it? Similarly, the congregation in the pot are cooked and boiled by the pastor's words. The problem is that this pot became an encrusted, rusty pot. If meat is cooked and boiled in this kind of pot, the rust will seep into the meat and the meat has to be thrown away. The hearts of the congregation should be boiled with the Word of God, which is like clean water. But since they are being boiled in an encrusted pot, will not all their souls die in the end? This is why God says to empty it out piece by piece without casting lots for them. For what reason, though, are these pastors cooking the congregation with their own words? 
Let's read Micah chapter 3, verses 1 to 3 and verse 11. Then I said, Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin, and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. Her leaders judge for a bride, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us. Well read. In Micah chapter 3, we read that it is their rulers and leaders, their pastors, who tear the skin of God's people and the flesh from their bones and chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. As seen in Micah chapter 3, verse 11, the reason God's people were cooked in an encrusted pot was to make them listen to their words and have them pay a lot of money. God foretold that such pastors would appear in the future. When the time came, the scribes and the Pharisees appeared at the first coming. Let's check through the Bible. Let's read Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 to 28. Woe well to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe well to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Well read. The scribes and Pharisees took over Judaism about 2,000 years ago and boiled the people of God in Satan's lies to make them obey their words. And they were pastors who were literally filled with greed and corruption who made God's people pay a lot of money. God wrote these things in the Bible to help His people perceive that they should never choose this kind of spiritual pot, and if one does belong to this kind of pot, then one must come out of there quickly. Now, let's take a look at God's pot. Let's read Zechariah chapter 14, verses 20 to 21. On that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. Every pot in Jerusalem and Judah will be holy to the Lord Almighty, and all who come to sacrifice will take some of the pots and cook in them. And on that day, there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord Almighty. Yes, well read. These words prophesied that holy pots, that is, sacred pots, would appear. If one is spiritually cooked in a clean pot, the Word of God will enter into one's hearts, and will we not all be transformed into the image of God? In the same way, Zechariah chapter 8, verse 3 prophesied that the city of truth will appear. The city of truth is a city built with the word of truth, that is, the church. This city of truth is a church built around Jesus at the first coming, and this church becomes a spiritual sacred pot. Then, what will be the pot of holiness at the time of Jesus' second coming? Let's read Revelation 15, verse 5. After this I looked, and in heaven the temple, that is a tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. Well read. In Revelation chapter 15, verse 5, it is prophesied that the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony will appear at the second coming of the Lord. This temple, which is a most holy place, will be a temple that testifies to the word of truth at the second coming. 
The meaning of the Temple of the Tabernacle of the Testimony means that this temple testifies to the prophecies of the New Testament and the reality of its fulfillment. Those who understand and believe the words of this testimony are considered God's people who keep the New Covenant. Therefore, this temple is a sacred pot of God. To summarize everything up, I believe you perceived the parable of pot is a church where God's people are gathered, and the different categories of pots is that one is a parable of the sacred holy pot, which is God's pot, and the rusty encrusted pot being Satan's pot. Thus, God is telling us through the Bible that there is a church where the truth flows and there is a church where lies are taught. So I hope we can discern through the Bible and become smart believers who belong to the church where the truth of God overflows from. Now, let me go over the conclusion. God washes away our sins with a word like fire and in turn judges those who do evil. Also, He does not hear the prayers of the wicked who do not have the word, but only the prayers of the righteous who do have the word. Therefore, we must reflect upon ourselves in the mirror of the Bible and examine how much we know and do God's will. The only standard of right and wrong is the Bible. I hope we can all become believers who fully understand the Bible and strive to be qualified to go to heaven. We who are living in the last days must understand all the secrets of heaven. This is because if we do not understand the secrets of heaven, we cannot go to heaven. Today is a time the parables are being clearly testified to just as Jesus promised. The reason why I can clearly testify is because what was spoken in parables appeared in reality. Then next time, we will go over elementary lesson 8 and learn about the figure of light, lamp, blind, the deaf, and clothes. The instructor who will give you the next lecture is a very special person who makes it much more fun and easier to understand than myself. Please make sure to learn more again the next time. I hope today was a time of much grace and understanding through the Word of God and Jesus. We are all one in God and in Jesus. Let's proclaim that we are one together. We are one. Thank you. Then let's pray for a moment. Thank you so much, Holy Father God, who is full of love and grace. Thank you so much for helping us understand the precious Word of God through Shincheonji's testimony on the parables of the secrets of heaven and their true meanings seminar. Today, at this time, we went over your word to cover the topic of the parable of fire, incense censor, and pot. Just like the words you gave us today, Please allow us to contain the fire-like Word of God in our hearts and allow us to become complete and pure believers in your sight as sin and any evil within us are consumed and taken away. I sincerely ask that you allow many people to participate in the seminar and fully perceive the parables and reality of the secrets of heaven and reach the kingdom of heaven. We ask you pour upon much more grace and blessings to those who attended today's seminar. And please add upon more of your blessings so that the seminars can be entirely successful. Thank you, and I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yes, thank you for listening to the end.